Aloha and Ekoma Mai. Welcome to the Millennial Entrepreneur, the newest show on Think Tech Hawaii. My name is Lindsay K. Wilbur, and I'm your host as we question what it means to be a millennial entrepreneur. Now, in order to understand what it means to be a millennial entrepreneur, we need to understand what it means to be a millennial and what it means to be an entrepreneur. Now, the most technical, simple definition of millennial is anyone between the ages of 18 to 34. And entrepreneur, well, it's a little bit more complicated. The term's been around for a little bit longer. Um, literally, the definition means one who undertakes. But generally, what it means, actually, is the ability to sense and act on opportunity by using creative thinking and determination to bring something new into the world. But I mean, this is an ex post term. We re it requires time to understand the impact of the entrepreneur. And we can only identify an entrepreneur after the fact. So, you know, others have attempted to be a little bit more specific. John Baptiste Say, for example, a 19th century French economist, defined an entrepreneur as one who shifts economic resources out of an area of lower and into an area of higher productivity uh, to produce a greater yield. So he added to the term entrepreneur um, an aspect of value creation, albeit purely economic. Um, you know, later, Josef Schumpeter situated the entrepreneur in a, the larger system of economics, saying that an entrepreneur is a driving force of the economic progress. In fact, without it, he said, economies would be static, structurally immobilized, and subject to decay. Um, he thought that when an entrepreneur identifies this commercial opportunity and then acts on it, other entrepreneurs uh, iterate and propagate this new model, creating uh, a sort of creative destruction. Um, so at once, the entrepreneur seems to be disruptive and generative. Um, he saw the entrepreneur as a change agent. But others argued, uh, especially Peter Ducker, an influential management consultant, that the entrepreneur is not, in fact, a change agent, but rather somebody who recognizes um, a changing momentum in society and um, sees that opportunity to build uh, an enterprise. Regardless, most entrepreneurs recognize some area of suboptimal equilibrium of dissatisfaction and seek to reinvent things uh, through direct action. Today in our show, um, I have a very inspiring individual named Patrick Dowd, who is the CEO of the Millennial Trains Project. Uh, the Millennial Trains Project is a series of transcontinental train journeys seeking to um, inspire leadership in the millennial generation. I had the opportunity to witness this endeavor firsthand this past August on the inaugural journey thanks to the generous support of the Institute for the Future. And it was an experience that truly opened my eyes to uh, what it means to be a millennial in this day and age and what it means to be an entrepreneur. So I'm very, very uh, honored to have Patrick on the show today. Thanks, Patrick, for joining us. Thanks for having me on. Aloha. Um, Aloha. <laughs> So could you tell us a little bit about uh, the story of the Millennial Trains Project? What inspired this vision? Sure. Well, the idea for the Millennial Trains Project comes from a similar project that I helped lead as a Fulbright Scholar in India about two years ago. And in India, this annual circumnavigation of the country by rail has been going on for about 10 years. And it's a big sensation with young people in that country. Last year, over 20,000 young Indians, millennials in India, applied for 400 spots on this train. And when I was there, I was sort of a camp counselor on that train. So I got to see firsthand the power of how this old form of infrastructure trains could be repurposed as a platform for imagining the future and reconnect people with this age-old wisdom that journeys build leaders. Hmm. And hey. That's the essence of what we brought here to the States with the Millennial Trains Project, where we are running crowdfunded train journeys across the country and reconnecting with the idea of what does it mean to be a pioneer in the American context. Our first train, which you were on board um, in August, 
was powered by the crowdfunded contributions of over a thousand individual supporters all around the country and world, really, who supported the aspirations of folks like yourself who came on board with their own individual project uh, and aspirations, which they advanced across each of the cities where our train stopped. So that's the model that we're using here. I think the first journey went really well. Uh, it was a big effort to pull off, um, combining uh, both new and old technology uh, to create something that um, I, I hope and, and think was a, a transformative experience for everyone involved and gives us a uh, basis from which to, to grow this um, as an offering for many more people to explore the geographical breadth of our country um, in this way, uh, using trains to imagine our future. Yeah, that's fascinating. And what were you doing before um, you launched this endeavor? And it was about a year and a half ago, right, that you first yeah. had this idea? Yeah, well, when I came back from India, I was working in investment banking at J.P. Morgan in New York, right as Occupy Wall Street was kind of reaching its height. And I felt that there was a more positive way to channel the dissatisfaction that a lot of people felt with where the country was than the, pro and I thought it would look more like this trains project that I helped lead in India than the protests that were going on um, outside our offices. Mm -hmm. So uh, I just quit and started building this trains project. <laughs> Yeah, and so you know, going back to that definition I said before about an entrepreneur, you know, realizing this kind of dissatisfaction or um, a suboptimal equilibrium. Um, you know, typically entrepreneurship is defined in economic terms, but it sounds like uh, the Millennial Trains Project seeks to encompass a more holistic vision of value creation and what you're really um, producing uh, as you know each of these train journeys uh, progress across the country sort of, um, you know, social networks that are being built um, and also uh, realizations, um, you know, connections that people maybe didn't make before, but seeing these different communities and sort of the emerging edges of innovation um, happening in all these towns um, maybe connects to a bigger vision of um, what their dreams really are. Um, and so... Yeah. I think you used the key word there, which is the edges. And uh, I mean, to the extent that I'm an entrepreneur and what gets me excited about the idea of, of making stuff happen is the idea of bringing things from the periphery or the edge of our world, of our communities, of our countries, and bringing them to the center. And I think that that's what, um, you know, a lot of people are doing when you see something that they're saying, oh, that, that fella or that gal is an entrepreneur. Um, a lot of times they're taking an idea that they've had uh, open enough eyes to recognize the promise of on the on the sort of edge of, of society or their community or the family and then bring it into the center and make it something that everyone else gets. And I think that um, it's interesting because there's an interesting balance between um, the the egoism and the humility of an entrepreneur because you have to be kind of um, confident or crazy or brave to think that you can take something from the edge to the center but then if you really want to acknowledge what's facilitating that flow it's that you're just part of the same soup of society and community that everyone else is that you're bringing this idea to and that's the reason why it resonated with you and it's the reason why it's going to resonate with everyone else. And one of the differences between an entrepreneur and somebody who's not an entrepreneur is that those sort of things that we feel on the edge of our lives and our society every day, that they have some inkling of meaning and promise, I think that entrepreneurs grab hold of those and run with them and, and try to make them bigger. Yeah, amen to that. And it's not easy. Uh, it's not easy. I'm sure there's challenges. Um, what what was some of uh, what were some of the challenges that you faced um, in trying to make this vision a reality? Well, the the biggest thing is inertia um, that exists 
in big institutions. Well, I don't know. I mean, I don't want to complain too much because a lot of things went right, and I, for you know, for every for every hundred people that didn't get it or like didn't want to be the first people to do something about it, there was one person who really did and who really mattered and who really did a lot to help me move forward. So I don't know if on balance it was more challenge or more luck that got me here and uh, and that got everyone that's a part of this here because there are a lot of people that support this besides just myself. So um, I want to say that you know on balance a lot of lucky things happen too when you get out there and you start hawking your idea. Um, it's like the people that you think are going to support you don't and then the most random people that you didn't even know existed come out of the woodwork and believe in what you're doing and they, they really propel you forward. So I don't want to act like it's just all hard and being entrepreneurs is hard. It's definitely hard. One of the hard things is um, just like when you when you see opportunities, other people you try to explain to them, oh, this makes sense for you. I mean, maybe realizing like where, where well, raising money is hard. So I, I, I guess that's, raising money is hard. Working with trains is hard. <laughs> Stuff's hard. And um, and crowdfunding is hard, and then managing teams is hard. So th those are some of the hard things. But that's also some of the rewarding stuff um, when you really like hit your stride in those areas. And the reason that they're hard, you know, if if it was easy, everybody would do it. Exactly. <laughs> but just because it's hard doesn't mean it's not worth doing. It's definitely worth doing. It's just it's just some kind of hard work. And I think you got to pick your pain. You know, like. There's pain in everyone's life, whether you sit back and let it come to you, or you go out and get it for yourself. <laughs> yeah. You so, earn that pain. <laughs> yeah, just you can totally choose your pain and be like, I want to get a painful time fundraising and managing a team and you know working with technology. So you know, at least you kind of know what is coming at you there. Definitely, definitely. Well, um, I think we're gonna take a break, a uh, commercial break. So we'll see you in a little bit. Aloha, I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech Hawaii, broadcasting live from the Pioneer Plaza in downtown Honolulu. We raise public awareness about tech, energy, and globalism in Hawaii. Technology is critical to our state. A vibrant tech sector will give us new prospects in the global marketplace and will offer great careers and make our economy more resilient. Streaming live on Ustream and Spreaker, ThinkTech allows its hosts and guests invaluable opportunities to report important events and discuss important questions, and to be heard here in Hawaii and around the world. You can find links to our live streams on thinktechhawaii.com or on our mobile website, m.thinktechhawaii.com. And you can see our archive on YouTube. It's all just a click away. We want to do whatever we can to keep Hawaii relevant, connected, and thriving in the complexity of the 21st century. We hope you will help us in those efforts. Tune in today. This is Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. Mahalo. Hello. You're watching The Millennial Entrepreneur. I'm Lindsay K. Wilburn, and we're on Think Tech Hawaii with Patrick Dowd, the CEO and founder of the Millennial Trains Project. So, Pat, right now you're in D.C. How's the weather over there? <laughs> it's, uh, the, the fall's just coming to an end, uh, so it's brisk. <laughs> nice. Um, and you're pretty involved in uh, entrepreneurship and innovation especially. Can you tell us a little bit, you know, us out here in the middle of the Pacific, what's going on in our nation's capital? Oh, absolutely. Well, I think that... This is a time of real dynamism, uh, actually, from an entrepreneurial and innovation standpoint in D.C., Des, uh, despite what's happening, uh, you know, in, in Congress and, the, and this blotch rollout with the healthcare care um, exchange, there are a lot of people that, young people that are starting to come here and uh, build a thriving entrepreneurial community. And I'm really excited about... Um, the potential for growing that community and having our nation's capital be a place that's really a, a mecca for social entrepreneurs around the world. 
it's an amazing place to launch a venture from because there are representatives here from every place that you could possibly want to take your idea. And as great as Silicon Valley is and all that that has to offer, it doesn't offer that kind of connectivity. And I think that that's something that's exciting about here, uh, being here. And then, of course, there's also a great sense of history um, that reminds us that we're part of a, of a continuum of a story of a great nation and that the next chapter of that is is our generation and the entrepreneurs and the innovators and the fearless people that care that are going to continue to build up our country. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. And what are um, like so what are, what would uh are there any hubs for um, you know innovation entrepreneurship in DC and if so what do they look like? Sure. Yeah, there are a couple hubs. Um, I mean, for the most part, the ones that I've seen, they're kind of floors of office buildings that have been redesigned and there are people working there on their startups and it's shared workspace and stuff like that. Um, I'm actually working on a pretty exciting new project that um, is going to launch next September where we are creating a social innovation incubator and sort of embassy of the future that's going to be housed at a historic property that overlooks the Potomac River, which is the river that runs through our nation's capital. And that's going to be a place that's that's really a home and a meeting place for forward-looking, imaginative uh, people aimed at amplifying the voice of, of young change makers and innovators here in DC. So it's like your embassy when someone like yourself would say we come to DC, you know, we would receive you with open arms. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds amazing. Sounds amazing. And um are the local politicians, um, you know, getting involved in uh, this burgeoning um, scene, entrepreneur innovation scene as well? Actually, yeah, I'm expecting a lot from, and, and we're already seeing a lot from the mayor's office. And now all the candidates that are running for office here um, in DC, they're actually competing over who has the best social innovation agenda. So, you know, I've talked with most of the candidates at this point, and that's just a great thing, you know. And it hasn't really been the case in the past, but I think it will be in the next couple of years, that the mayor of D.C. really speaks to a national audience in the same way that mayors of cities like uh, Los Angeles or New York or San Francisco do. And I think that's very exciting because we're not seeing a lot of hope or inspiration coming out of Congress. Um, that's for sure. Word up. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and what about millennials? Um, what are what are some commonalities that you know you see in millennials nowadays in DC or um, you know in your general life? Um, what what is it really that um, you kind of identify with the millennial generation? Number one biggest thing is sharing and peer to peer networks. That's totally different and totally unprecedented, and I think that it's going to have profound um, and profoundly positive implications for our society because. When, when people are sharing based on need and what they can, what they can share, that breaks down barriers um, between communities and prejudice and, and builds community. So, you know, whether that's with Airbnb, with people from totally different backgrounds, just staying in each other's houses because it's economically practical, or this sort of skill share stuff, which so much of the Millennial Trains Project is fueled by, where people just kind of the things that are respectable and honorable and noble, people want to um, support them, so they share their skills, and then that ends up creating new kinds of value for people. Um, so I, I think seeing um, you know purpose as a commodity is something that's really revolutionary about our generation, that and and and, and an asset and something that is as much a part of the value proposition as whatever the, the monetary side um, of it will be. And for sure, um, you know, uh, income, people's income and their earning ability, that, that's important, but like you don't need as much money um, if, if you're sharing and people are sharing with you, like you just don't. So I think people are finding ways to, to live better with more purpose and less money, which is just a reality. Absolutely, absolutely. And really, you know, using uh, the resources and minimizing waste, I think, is really important. But, you know, typically, um, it seems as though 
that when people are doing business for good or you know these purpose-driven initiatives, um, it seems that frequently, um, at least you know, if not massive economic gain, but certainly, um, you know, they they aren't doing poorly um, business-wise. Um, at the Social Good Summit, I heard this phrase doing good for business or doing business for good is good for business um, and I think as we begin to expand uh, our toolkit to include um, you know things other than economic value I think that understanding the relationship between um, the social value um, this kind of like internal purpose and these other elements in the ecosystem of innovation and entrepreneurship I think we'll begin to understand how they sort of play um, a role in shaping a successful venture. Uh, yeah, I would say, though, like with that social good summit and other stuff, I mean, I had a, a, a real reminder today of like what's real and what's not. I had a, a meeting with a major global drinks brand that is kind of trying to market itself as you know, like having a lot of purpose and caring about the environment and stuff like that. And I think when you look under the hood of some of that stuff, it's not always super genuine. And, but like some brands, they get that our generation cares about it. So, I mean, there are some brands that really are dedicated to that, but there are also a lot that aren't. And so I think that one way to kind of get past uh, being hoodwinked by sort of like social good washing of stuff mm. is really really hold individuals accountable and support individuals that believe in individuals because that's like that's where the real change comes from is people that are trying like not brands that are trying um, interesting so making that uh, looking at the impact on the individual or um, you know, how the individual in a community plays a part in whatever enterprise it is? Kind yeah. of like, hmm. And I think brands that support individuals are great also, but like, it, it can't just be advertising, you know? Like, it can't just be ads that say, oh, we're down for social good, and it's like this really flowy, nice, hip-looking ad. That's just an ad, you know? Like, I want to see brands really supporting individuals like the ones that come on the millennial trainings project who are putting like their whole lives on the line to try and create positive change that's who brands should be report supporting that's a very genuine way to support social innovation is by supporting individuals at the front lines of it as opposed to just tweeting about it definitely and creating those leaders too um who can inspire other individuals and um, sort of a Ponzi scheme for good, almost. <laughs> what do you mean by that? What's that? What, 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 do you mean, what do you mean by that? Oh, I mean that if an individual, for example, with the Millennial Trains Project, mm -hmm. um, different organizations have supported, you know, the inaugural journey had 24 participants. And so the these organizations supported these individuals, but then, um, Although the impact is difficult to measure, uh, these individuals are then, these 24 individuals are going out and sharing what they've learned, what they've experienced, and um, what really is inspiring them. Um, and then the idea is that, you know, these 24 millennials who are on the train then maybe will, um, you know, sh inspire one or two of their friends. And then maybe those friends will, you know, inspire one or two of their friends and suddenly, there's a movement building of some sorts, you know? Well, I think that the impact is actually not difficult to measure. Um, it, the thing is it, that, like, you need to measure impact in three dimensions. Uh, it's, it's not a monolithic thing. So there's the breadth and the depth and the reach of what you're doing. So I think, you know, to say, all right, Undoubtedly, when we look at the exit surveys from people that have been on these transcontinental journeys, um, how much they've grown as leaders, and universally they say, this was a deeply transformative experience for me. So we can say that's 24 people there. And then we stopped in 10 communities and we highlighted what was innovative and, and groundbreaking in those communities, so they were changed. So, I mean, we can say that 24 people's lives were changed by this. How many people's lives are changed by an ad campaign that, you know, um, 
10,000 people see on Twitter? None. But 10,000 people like saw a tweet about it. So that's a, a maybe a very broad um, sort of impact, but it's very shallow. Whereas the Millennial Change Project, it's very deep. It's literally changing people's lives. And that pays dividends over the course of their lives as they pursue a path of purpose driven leadership as opposed to like not being impacted in that kind of way. So I don't think that um, young change makers and entrepreneurs should be daunted if they don't have a big fat number to st stick next to what we're doing, what they're doing. You know, also think about how deep is this going, you know? Maybe you're just changing your, your one town, your one community, or just one school, like being a Teach for America um, professor, you know? Like the impact that one TFA fellow has is so much more than like an ad, ad campaign. They're just changing so many people's lives. And, and you know, it, it, I think it's just a total uh, failure of, of, of vernacular and, and ways that people are speaking with this impact measurement stuff that only stuff with a lot of zeros after it is considered impactful because that's shallow stuff and we need to be supporting the deep stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And even um, I read a study by Stanford recently that said it's not actually the skills which um, prevent people from um, beginning to undertake these projects or these um, visions that they have, but um, it's actually their their view, the view of themselves, their the view of how much um, they can accomplish. Um, and that's what is the limiting factor. So it sounds like that's really where you're addressing where um, the most impact can be made as well. Um, so we're uh, here on the Millennial Entrepreneur, Think Tech Hawaii, and um, we're gonna take a break. Thank you so much for watching. Aloha, I'm Nicole Horry for Think Tech. For nearly half a century, the Hawaii Foreign Trade Zone Number 9 has brought the benefits of the Foreign Trade Zone Program to Hawaii businesses and entrepreneurs. DBET, the Department of Business, Economic Development, and Tourism, operates Hawaii's Foreign Trade Zone Program to encourage international business and economic development. The Foreign Trade Zone's mission is to increase the amount of international trading activity in Hawaii, thereby providing employment opportunities for the residents of our island state. For more information, see ftz9.org. I'm Nicole Hori. Mahalo. Hi, we're back on The Millennial Entrepreneur. My name is Lindsay K. Wilver, and we're, you're watching Think Tech Hawaii with Patrick Dowd, the CEO and founder of The Millennial Trains Project. Um, so we were just talking a little bit about um, when people are uh, you know, f faced with uh, the need to measure the impact of their endeavor, um, what, what is it that they um, look for? Is it a big number or um, is a small, different, uh, small but uh, meaningful difference um, going to be uh, okay. And so, Patrick, can you tell us a little bit about more advice on, um, you know, people, young people who are seeking to, um, to undertake some sort of project um, and, you know, how do they frame this? Uh, is there any advice that you could offer? Um, my number one piece of advice would be don't seek validation from other people. Just and, and don't give other people the power of giving you validation or not, just seek guidance. And I think that uh, the way our education system works, it builds us into sort of validation seeking machines where you wanna get an A or you wanna get a, a bonus in your job or you wanna get a raise. But that form of thinking is very corrosive to the entrepreneurial spirit because you're not gonna get that right away at an early stage until you really start just, just you know hitting your stride so if you just you just need to know that what you're doing is is right and have a deep conviction and then i think you can be very unstoppable because when people see that you're not asking for them for their permission to do stuff they either get out of your way or they get on board with what you're doing <laughs> and, and they want to help it out and and just ask for people's guidance in a, in, in a humble way but also not not like you're gonna just stop what you're doing if they tell you they don't think it's cool. It doesn't matter if they think it's cool, you're gonna do it no matter what. And I think that you need to have some sort of tunnel vision like that, especially to, 
to hold you in good stead in the dark days that inevitably accompany any entrepreneur's journey. Yeah, definitely. That's um, I think that's good advice. And there are a lot of budding, um, budding entrepreneurs and um, you know social innovators out there. Um, you know, we see this rise in um, Startup Weekend, you know, since 2007 and other kind of um, entrepreneurial endeavors that seek to um, inspire young people to begin this kind of journey. Um, what, what do you think about, um, what do you think about these kind of initiatives? Um, have you been to a Startup Weekend in D.C. or anything like that, a hackathon? What do you think? Yeah, I've been to a couple of them and I think that they're good for growing culture of entrepreneurship. And and making it something that more people um, understand and are intrigued by it and might end up pursuing. Um, it's sort of like, look at, you know, soccer. 25 years ago, like, not a lot of people played soccer or lacrosse. And then they do all these camps and people get with soccer and with lacrosse and then it becomes a big sport. And it becomes part of the culture of the nation. And I think that elevating entrepreneurship and social change making to sort of a paragon status in our culture is a great thing because then we're going to get the best entrepreneurs and the best we're going to keep getting the best entrepreneurs and the best social change makers in the world coming out of america a, a great analogy would be look at jamaica you know um there the summa bonum of the, the highest honor like sense of achievement one of them in jamaican life is becoming international reggae star so if you go to jamaica you're going to find tons and tons of people that are really great reggae artists much more than you would anywhere else in the world because their culture rewards that sort of endeavor and aspiration and by the same token if we as a culture reward entrepreneurship and social change making with stature and respect um, then we're going to get a lot of great talent in, in that area and that's exactly the kind of talent that we need yeah, and so yeah, that's interesting. That so America, um, I guess, has always had a tradition of um, of upstarters, of entrepreneurs, um, and I suppose in this, I suppose there are some um, you know things to take into consideration for hackathons or for startup weekend where. Um, it is sort of a, um, you know, like you get a almost like a sugar rush conference kind of feeling um, after attending one, but then it's almost difficult to sustain um, like a more long-term um, kind of commitment. And there's a, a lot of these startups that are happening where, you know, they create an app or they um, do something that uh, takes, um, you know, it's a, it's a shorter effort, it's a shorter period of time for it to really get up and running and um, you know the impact of which you know really differs but what do you think about sort of this um, like the startup the um, you know app startup world um, versus like a more um, like a physical person to person like setting up a space or setting up an educational program like the Millennial Trans Project like where do you see um, these uh, these two kinds of um, types of entrepreneurship. Um, how do you see them working in uh, in this scene today? Like, do you see people going for more of um, the coding, programming, that sort of startup, or do you see um, anything in sort of this other direction? Um. I don't know that there's actually a real schism there. I think that maybe it's just kind of the same stuff, but the medium and the focus is a little bit different because um, like what we're doing with the trains project involves plenty of hacking, but it's just not coding, but like figuring out the US train system and the government bureaucracy that surrounds that and dealing with that in a graceful way is, you know, <laughs> sort of a hack. Uh, it's not something that's been done before. So, um, you know, I think it's about a mentality and a culture. And also, I would not, I'm, I'm really uh, against, like, I, I kind of believe in this wisdom of young people doing things in their own stupid way, like, however best they can. And people that, like, I'm not going to say that people who are working uh, on apps are, are, like, not legit because apps don't, like, necessarily save someone's life. I think that it's building habits 
of creative thinking, of design thinking, of entrepreneurship in the next generation. And that's great because instead of these people sitting in a bank, like where I was sitting before I started this and just doing menial work with zero purpose, they are out there hacking it and trying to design stuff that matters to them in the context of you know where they are at this point in their lives. There's absolutely nothing keeping all these people that are out there building apps from taking that same energy and intuition and sensibility that they've honed building apps and turning that on all different sorts of stuff in our system. And that's what I anticipate is exactly what they're gonna do. And it's gonna have an incredibly positive impact on the future of our country and the world. Definitely, and because really, um, like you said, sort of this entrepreneurial spirit, um, and there are so many different kinds of entrepreneurs. There's, um, you know, knowledge entrepreneurs. There's public entrepreneurs, um, and you know, th so this kind of spirit can be really embodied, whatever position um, you are in, even if you work within a larger company. Um, so the other night we were talking about intrapreneurs, and I was wondering if you could maybe um, define that and explain a little bit about what that is, and maybe how you feel like one yourself. Sure. Well. Uh, entrepreneur is somebody that acts entrepreneurially within the context and confines of an, a big existing organization. And to the point we were just talking about, you know, all these app developers, hackers, light hackers, different people taking their energies and turning it on different stuff. They're also going to turn that on corporations because they're going to go into companies. Part of the reason that young people are able to do audacious things is because they don't have a ton of responsibilities. It's really easy to go build a millennial trains project or a cool app or some different thing when you don't have a family that is relying on you, you know, and you can just kind of couch surf and create whatever your thing is. But as our generation ages, we are going to have to develop more steady income streams if the app we were working on for a couple of years didn't, you know, become the next Instagram, we're gonna have to go and get other kinds of jobs but what's great about that is that we're going to bring that entrepreneurial skill set and mindset to working organizations, and we're going to have a generation of corporate culture that's defined by entrepreneurship and that's led by entrepreneurship. So I've actually gotten the opportunity recently to do some entrepreneurship because I became an um, editor at large for National Geographic Traveler, which is the most circulated travel magazine in the world. And they brought me in there to basically just think big and um, you know, try to help them think of new ways to do some stuff. So we're just putting together, I mean, right now I can say that that's actually really fun. And we are making a lot of progress really fast because, and it's almost in some ways actually way more fun than just couch surfing and trying to get your own crazy idea started. Because when you have the, the resources of, uh, and the credibility and the stature of an organization like National Geographic behind your big hairy idea, it moves a lot faster and that's really fun as opposed to just like really hawking it out in the early stages of a completely new idea with no organization behind you. So I don't, I, I think that entrepreneurship can be just as exhilarating and maybe even more rewarding or more, or more rewarding sooner than entrepreneurship. Yeah, and it seems like, you know, people working together, like you were, we were talking about networks earlier and different kinds of value creation. But um, working together within some sort of institution or organization, um, but allowing uh, that kind of freedom for entrepreneurially entrepreneurial adventures, um, really uh, packs a punch that working by yourself might not have, um, and that maybe is going to be a trend that we see in the workplace. Uh, so we're going to take another break. Um, my name is Lindsay Lindsay K Wilbur, and you're watching the Millennial Entrepreneur on Think Tech Hawaii. Aloha, I'm Jay Fidel for ThinkTech. For nearly half a century, the Hawaiian Foreign Trade Zone, number nine, has brought the benefits of the Foreign Trade Zone program to Hawaii businesses and entrepreneurs. DBED, the Hawaii Department of Business, Economic Development, and Tourism, operates Hawaii's Foreign Trade Zone program. It does so to encourage international business and economic development. The Foreign Trade Zone mission is to increase the amount of international trading activity in Hawaii, thereby providing employment opportunities for the residents of our island state. For more information, see ftz9.org. I'm Jay Fidel of ThinkTech. Mahalo. 
Hello, you're watching Think Tech Hawaii. Um, I'm Lindsay K. Wilbur, the host of The Millennial Entrepreneur, and we have Patrick Dowd uh, here visiting us from DC over the interwebs. And uh, he's the CEO and founder of the Millennial Trains Project. Um, so thanks for joining us, Patrick. Um, now, after all this talk, um, I'm really curious to know, what are some of the next steps for you and, um, and your endeavors personally in like the next, um, you know, the next couple of years? Well, um, that's something that I'm kind of working through right now. I know what I'm doing for about the next year, but beyond that, um, I'm having to like do, go through a process of discernment because I'm um, basically of whether keep doing all this entrepreneurial stuff that I'm doing or go to graduate school which I feel like would be really a timeout right now. Like, I'm, I'm excited about the what, all the stuff that I'm doing with the Millennial Trains Project and National Geographic and building the entrepreneurial ecosystem in DC, helping to do that. And at the same time, like, you know, many people go to graduate school, and my parents did, they were saying, oh, you should be thinking about going to graduate school. But to me, that doesn't feel especially exciting at this point, um, but, so I don't know, I guess I'm trying to make up my mind about that. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, it can definitely, I'm, I'm taking graduate classes now at the University of Hawaii. And um, it's extremely intellectually stimulating, but it really does um, kind of absorb all of your attention um, in you know writing and reading. And there's not actually like, at least in the program that I'm in, there's not uh, too much action. Um, that's going on. So sometimes I think uh, it's good to take your education into your own hands and get a little rogue with it, um, which I I'm, can see that you've been doing since you graduated from Georgetown, right? Yeah. Well, one thing that I'm working on is there's some there's some cool film stuff that's going on around the Millennial Trains Project, actually. So I think we're going to be doing a film project. Um, so like rather than learning about making movies in college, I think I'm going to be doing one in the real world or in grad school, I guess. Yeah, well, so. you, can, you can call it your, your, self, you know, your self-directed grad school experience and give yourself a nice piece of paper at the end. <laughs> 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 so, um, so the next journey for the Millennial Trains Project is this coming March, right? Yeah, we're going from Los Angeles to Miami, and we're stopping in seven cities along the way. Which, what are those cities? We're going Los Angeles, Albuquerque, Kansas City, Louisville, Chattanooga, Atlanta, and Miami. And we're, going, we're doing it on a fleet of vintage rail cars from the 1950s. That's going to be our own community um, as we go across the country, where we'll sleep. Um, we'll have meals, lectures from distinguished mentors talking about what are the new frontiers in different areas of our society and really creating a space apart from the frenetic pace of modern day life where we can really think deeply, engage deeply and listen deeply and dream deeply so that we can go back out into the world and more powerfully pursue our passions and, and creating things. Wow, that's yeah, that's so amazing. amazing. And uh, when will applications be available for the next trip? Next week. We're opening them next week. And the way that you yeah. get on board is by pitching a project that you want to advance across all the communities where our train stop, and then racing to raise $5,000. That's our admissions process. We don't say if your idea is good or bad. We let the crowd decide. And it's awesome to see the kind of diversity and high caliber um, ideas that that brings out um, of the ether. On our last journey, I mean, we had everything from energy innovation to reproductive health to poetry to local governance futures. So <laughs> we're just seeing um, what kind of amazing ideas come uh, forth from this amazing um, cohort that is our generation. and. We'll go on a journey together, and we'll see our country. We'll go to some places that you know we've never been to, and I think that that's just as exciting, if not more exciting, than going to a foreign country. I mean, 
we ourselves are a united uh, states of many nations, and we're a very diverse country, and it's a very exciting place to explore. Yeah, I mean, I remember going through um, through the Midwest and you know into Pittsburgh. I'd never been to Pittsburgh before, and I found it to be such an inspiring place. I sort of had imagined it being uh, like billowing smoke clouds or something like that from like some you know early 20th century image of the city, but it was. Um, we were hanging out at the tech shop, we were hanging out a couple of different co-working incubator spaces, and the people there were so, so inspiring. Um, and also, I remember, yeah, Omaha and Denver were also two other cities that really stood out for me and really surprised me um, in the, not only the caliber of people that were there, but just the um, city planning, the architecture, the feel of the city. Um, it felt to me that I got a different version um, of the place than I did reading about in, in history books in school, that's for sure. Um, sure. You just yeah. really can't learn about places on the internet in the way that you can by going there. And the new frontiers of opportunity for our generation are in the small and mid-sized cities of the United States. And just go there and you see it, just like you were saying. Yeah, it's amazing. And um, so are there any, uh, like, um, do you know of any of the mentors that you're talking to that might be on the train? Yeah, also, we're, we're going to have a great group for our next journey. Um, it, it's going to be eminent people from, you know, different uh, parts of society. So we're still, like, on the last journey, we're having, um, you know, the editor-in-chief of National Geographic Traveler. He's going to be there. Um, some famous venture capitalists, uh, educators from some of the best institutions in the country, artists, architects, futurists, technologists. It should be a, a mind-blowing ride. Sounds great. Well, I can't wait. Um, so, I think uh, I think we're about to wrap up now. Okay. Um, but this was, uh, you know, the first episode of the Millennial Entrepreneur, and our inquiry took us to uh, new and exciting places across the country on a vintage train car. It took us to our nation's capital, and. I'm excited to see how Hawaii um, begins to really gain stride in this entrepreneur innovation scene and, and see how we uh, interpret entrepreneurship Hawaiian style. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in. This is Think Tech Hawaii. My name is Lindsay K. Wilbur, um, the host of The Millennial Entrepreneur. And thank you so much again, Patrick. You're an incredibly inspiring individual. And um, I look forward to working with you in the future. Aloha. Mahalo.